So it's another in conservation with my name is David Lindell, also known as the Urban Birder. Um, tonight I have uh, a very special guest. By the way, tonight being in Western Europe, but where he is, is actually this afternoon. Uh, Eric Eaton, thank you very much for coming along tonight, this afternoon, today, sparing your time to, to talk to us about a very interesting subject. Um, how are you and where are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. I'm in Leavenworth, Kansas, uh, USA. That's right on the, the uh, Missouri River that borders uh, Kansas and Missouri. And it's about one o'clock here. You know, you've given very precise instructions or directions, I say, as to where you are. I still have no clue where you are, to be honest. Um, other than the fact you're in uh, the US, I believe you kind of Missouri uh, figures in the middle, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we're almost dead center in the in the US. Okay, well, kind of right. Um, today, um, or should I say, in conservation with is, is sponsored by the Deputation de Catharis which is the uh, tourism board that looks after the northern province of Extremadura, the amazing region in southwest Spain for birding, and also um, by Leica Sport Optic. So thank you very much, guys. Um, one other question I'm going to ask you, Eric, before we start tonight, which I know I have the wrong answer to, is this guy a wasp? And if so, well, why not? Uh, it is not. It is a fly. <laughs> um, it, very easy to get confused. There's myriad kinds of insects that mimic wasps, and so you're totally forgiven for expecting that to be a wasp. Phew. I mean, it was actually a wasp, I, an insect I discovered in, in Colombia, and I took a picture because I was thinking maybe it could be new, to, new for science and I might get my name on onto a, a new animal, but uh, I probably, I doubt it. But, it could be though. I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> discovered species, that's for certain. Absolutely. We're here also because um, Eric has written this really great book, um, Wasps. And it's actually, when you think about it, it's wasps, an astonishing diversity of a misunderstood insect. When you think about it, or when you look at that book, in fact, when I first came across it, I was expecting it to be one of those field guides, you know, filled with different pages of types of wasps. But instead, it's a really exciting and interesting uh, look at the life style of wasps per se. And I must say, reading through this book, and I must say also that it's beautifully designed, fantastic images and, and, um, and photographs in this. Um, it is so fascinating to learn all about, not just about the wasps themselves, but the insects um, that uh, imitate them, and also, interestingly, the, um, the relationship they have with us, not only in terms of when we're sitting around and having our picnics, but also in folklore and, and history. So it'd be good to have a quick chat about that. Now, um, we're going to crack on in that um, Eric has a short presentation about wasps, which I'm really very eager to learn uh, from. So um, in order to view this, don't forget to put your Zoom setting onto speaker view and you'll get the whole screen as opposed to a motley crew of people and just a tiny little image somewhere of the, of the actual um, PowerPoint. So I'm going to hand over to you, Eric, because I think it's better to be a little bit educated before I start asking questions. I mean, if I got it wrong from the get-go, I better start sort of learning now. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know how to get to speaker view though. <laughs> um, you, you don't have to, it's, it's all of us that need to see that, but you're, oh, you're gotcha. fine, it's all looking beautiful. Okay, thank you. Um, well, this is, I'm gonna have to truncate this a little bit because it was designed as a 45 minute presentation for another group. So I apologize if I race through a few things here. Uh, but basically this book came about because the publisher came to me and they wanted to, to do something on wasps. And this was, uh, by the way, this was not Princeton University Press, who's the publishing partner. 
but it was um, Unipress books in the UK. So this really started in, in on your soil over there. And for that, I am forever grateful. Uh, a lot of our really good information uh, that is shared with the world about misunderstood creatures comes out of your country. And I appreciate that very much. Um, so why, why write a book about wasps? Um, and I'm not able to advance the slides. I wonder why that is. I wonder if you need to press the, uh, the arrow key. I am. Oh, or maybe, um, this, uh, <laughs> Maybe it's another key you can press. Hmm. I am very sorry for this. Zoom let, me, let me stop sharing for a second and restart here. Okay. Um, but um, as I say, the idea of wasps is quite interesting because most of us think of uh, yellow and black striped creatures that hover around your jam sandwiches uh, in September and make a bit of a, a nuisance of themselves. But right. Sure. Here we go. There you go. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that, right. thank you. That's exactly where I was going to start is that, that, you know, our, our public definition of wasps is, is very narrow. And it's basically these social species like yellow jackets in this case, or also hornets and paper wasps, these social insects, that we have the most negative interactions with. And they, you know, that, that's a very unfortunate thing. Uh, some, some people may recognize mud daubers also as wasps, but we still don't have a terribly high opinion of them because they make their mud nests on our buildings and, and what have you. And they, some people consider them an eyesore, but the reality is that wasps are far more diverse than that. Uh, most of them are solitary. That means each female has her own nest or she goes directly to a host organism to exploit that as food for her offspring. Most of them are extremely tiny. I mean, like under five millimeters easily. And, and that's some of the diversity you see here on this slide are very, very tiny wasps, fairy flies, some are said to be so small they could fly through the eye of a needle. I don't doubt it. Some are barely larger than a, a large one-celled organism. So we're talking about very tiny insects for the majority of wasp species. Other wasps, you wouldn't recognize the wasps because they don't have wings. And, and several families of wasps include species in which the females are wingless. And in some cases, the males may be wingless as well. And so those include things like velvet ants and some ichneumon wasps. Again, solitary insects, not social, like we're accustomed to and familiar with. Sometimes it's not the, the wasp itself that, that uh, gets your attention, but something it creates. And, and in this case, gall wasps, again, very, very tiny wasps, but the female in the course of laying her eggs in plant tissue, programs the plant to produce some kind of mass like this that serves as both food and home shelter protection for her larval offspring. These galls, by the way, rarely, if ever, do damage to the plant. It's just shunts nutrients uh, disproportionately to, to surround that, that wasp baby. Well, why should we care? You know, what, what do wasps do for us or, or do for the world at large? Where, well, they provide a number of ecosystem services, not the least of which is pollinating flowers. Uh, most wasps are flower visitors, so they're there for nectar, but in the course of, of, of getting nectar to fuel their energetic flight, uh, they will pollinate uh, uh, flowers in, in that process. Some, like the pollen wasps, uh, are, are actual dedicated pollinators because they're harvesting pollen to feed their offspring. It's a very rare phenomenon uh, known in only a few kinds of wasps uh, where instead of providing some other organism, they're providing pollen and nectar. This is something I just learned about and it's not included in the book. So bonus for you guys, I guess. <laughs> uh, but some wasps actually disperse seeds and that's what uh, in this case, it's called Vespicocori 
you're probably familiar with myrmimicocori, which is the dispersal of seeds by ants. Uh, but it turns out that wasps will also do this on occasion for certain plants. And this is for plants that have seeds with an attached mass called an eliasome. And the eliasome is full of, of fats and, and proteins that the wasp cuts off the seed on her way back to the nest uh, to feed to her larval offspring. And so she's dispersing seeds as she goes in delivering that eliasome, that nutritious eliasome to her offspring. Wasps are also an important part of the food web. Some scientists do not consider sawflies to be wasps. They're very primitive, that's for certain, in terms of the evolution of wasps. They don't have a wasp waist, as we tend to think of wasps. Uh, the larvae of sawflies feed on foliage, uh, much like caterpillars do. So it's oftentimes sawfly larvae are mistaken for, for caterpillars, in fact. And the relatives of sawflies include the horn tails, which are much larger wasps. And, and the, they, these can be very intimidating because it looks like they have a huge stinger, but it's actually the egg laying organ of the female. She has no venom. She inserts her eggs into dead or dying trees and her larvae then bore into the wood as shown in the far right slide there. But most of the wasps that we can, can think of when we think of wasps are what are called parasitoids. And that is that the female wasp exploits another insect or maybe a spider as a host. And so she lays her egg directly into that host in the case of, of things like the ichneumon wasp there on the left. And you may think, well, how, do, how is she going to get a big adult wasp out of such a tiny host? And in this case, it's because the, the egg that she inserts into the host, the larva that hatches waits while the host larva feeds and matures, and then it starts feeding on the host. So there's a lot of very intricate steps involved in a lot of the life cycles of these insects. Here are a couple more examples of, of wasps that exploit uh, caterpillar hosts. And, and in the case of the larger uh, parasitoid wasps, the female paralyzes her host with a sting and then carts it back to a nest that she has already prepared, as, it, as in the case with a thread wasted wasp on the left. The smaller wasps tend to insert their eggs directly into the host and then leave without building any kind of nest for them. But uh, wasps are also food for other organisms, including birds, uh, like the, the western tanager on the left there that has captured a paper wasp, and it will either rip out the sting uh, before eating it or, or slam the wasp into unconsciousness before it gobbles it down. Lizards also will feed often on, on wasps. Sometimes the, the biggest enemy of wasps is another wasp. And we just mentioned the horntail that lays her eggs in, in dead and dying trees. Well, that is followed by these gigantic ichneumon wasps, the females of which somehow divine the location of a horntail grub within the tree, then drill down to reach it and lay an egg on it. And so you have these kind of, uh, you know, wasp on wasp kinds of ecosystem relationships. Wasps are also uh, food for other invertebrates as well, uh, from crab spiders that wait in ambush on, on flowers to, to, uh, to take advantage of the pollinating wasps that, that come and visit. Ambush bugs, they do the same kind of thing. And then you have insects like robber flies on the right there that actually uh, wait in ambush, but accost their victims in midair and bring them down to where they can feed on them. And parasitoids have parasitoids. And so again, flies are, are the ones in this case, uh, ground nesting wasps like the, uh, the digger wasp there on the left will, often you will see smaller insects kind of orbiting around them. And these are called satellite flies. And so the satellite fly female will wait for an opportunity to lay not an egg, but a larva at the edge of that nest burrow. And the larva will crawl down into the nest and become a parasitoid that ultimately kills the, the wasp larval host. 
And bee flies like the one on the right there operate similarly, but they will, they will bomb an egg down into the burrow while hovering over the burrow entrance. Wasps also provide free pest control in your yard or garden. So just, you know, for example, aphids are exploited by this ultra little teeny tiny wasp that turns an aphid into a mummy. She lays an egg into the aphid and her offspring begins feeding on it. And up, up here we have uh, normal aphids in the center picture there. And as they're fed on by this larval wasp, they bloat up into these mummies that become just a shell, literally a shell of their former selves. And when the adult wasp is ready to emerge, it cuts a hole in the back of the aphid and pops out. And there are other related types of wasps that do the same thing to caterpillars. And so you have these, these round holes in this caterpillar shell where you've had adult uh, wasps emerge from them. The other wasps, as we mentioned, will either, like the social wasps, chew up a victim uh, and then take it back to the nest to feed to the larvae in the paper combs. Or if you have solitary wasps, they'll paralyze their, their host victim and then cart it back to the nest and store it there. And one or more host organisms will be food for, the, for her larval wasp. There's hardly, scarcely any insect or other arthropod that is not exploited in some fashion by a wasp. It's, it's truly, truly remarkable. Well, insects or wasps also figure into science and invention. For example, you have the European bee wolf over there. Uh, and we have a similar species here in America, like the one on the, on the left. The European bee wolf was studied by Nico Tinbergen, who demonstrated that the female wasp uses landmarks to find her nest once she returns from hunting trips. And he shared a Nobel Prize uh, with Conrad Lorenz and with Carl von Frisch in 1973. And that set the foundation for the whole study of ethology or animal behavior. So you can credit wasps with, uh, with the founding of, of ethology, in part at least. And there's some debate as to whether or not it was pa paper wasps that inspired paper making in, in humans, but there's no question that it influenced uh, a Frenchman at one point when there were a shortage of other kinds of uh, substances that were used in paper, paper making at that time. And he witnessed paper wasps using wood fibers and suggested that they may want to switch to wood fibers to produce paper. And, and here we have modern paper making as a result of that. One of the things I appreciate about wasps in, in, in general is their sheer beauty. I mean, you have these brilliant metallic colors in some Others are marked boldly with, with black and white or yellow or orange or red, very striking uh, organisms. These, all these bold colors uh, give other insects the idea to mimic them because basically what wasps are doing when they have these bold colors is advertising the fact that, that some of them can sting. And so other insects that do not sting understandably would like to have the appearance that they do it through convergent evolution. We have many other insects uh, looking like wasps, especially flies like the one in the, in the center there, the, the hover fly and some beetles even uh, as like the one on the right there. So I've come up with this, this clever, uh, hopefully it's clever, <laughs> little interactive element in, in talks that I give called a wasp, not wasp, in which I present slides showing at least two organisms and asking the audience to, to determine which one is a wasp and which one is not, or if they're both wasps, or if neither one is a wasp. And I'm going to quickly go through these. You'll have to forgive me, but for time constraints, I'm jumping ahead to show that in this instance, the insect on the left is a wasp, a spider wasp, and the one on the right there is actually a moth that flies during the day and flies in a similar fashion to the wasp. Not only just does it look like it, it also behaves very similarly. 
in this example, and this is from, again, from the United States. So, so it may be, uh, it, it would be understandable if you recognize neither of these insects. But the one on the left is a mantis fly, which is something related to lace wings and ant lions, but it has mantis-like front legs that it uses to seize prey with. And the insect on the, on the right is one of our common paper wasps out in the Western US. Here we've got three insects. And of those three, two of them are wasps, or if you consider sawflies to be wasps in any event. Uh, and the last one is a bee. Many bees resemble wasps in the fact that they're not as hairy as we would expect a bee to be. <laughs> Uh, and they're marked boldly also with, with black and yellow. So how can you help wasps or, or why would you want to? Hopefully I, I've given you the idea that yes, it's a good idea to have wasps around because of the ecosystem services they provide and the free pest control and pollination, things like that. Well, you can start by landscaping with native plants. And I think over on your side of the pond, you're way ahead of us here in the United States. Uh, and I want to compliment you uh, collectively for that. But we're just now starting to catch up here and, and using native plants for landscaping and making things like pollinator gardens. We're also learning to be weed tolerant because one man's weed is another man's wildflower. And certainly that's the case for wasps. Uh, you know, wasps are after nectar. They tend to like flowers that are in an umbel shape or a raceme. Uh, or a composite. And so that's because they like to be able to see what's going on around them. You won't find too many wasps diving headlong into a tubular flower when something could attack them from the back. So they like to be on flowers that they can see what's going on around them while they feed. And I have a feeling that's true for a, a majority of pollinating insects. Become a wasp watcher. Uh, I don't know if, if any of you have seen documentaries about, uh, you know, bees and, you know, landscaping and providing housing for bees, but the same kind of thing can apply for, to wasps as well. And they're very interesting, fascinating things to watch. Remember to use the right equipment for watching the hornet nest. And yes, I kid here, these are really birders, uh, but I, I had to do this, of course, because you want to stay a safe distance from a hornet nest. It doesn't take much equipment to become a wasp watcher. Uh, these days, your phone can probably take better pictures than, or at least as good of pictures as your camera can. Uh, close focusing binoculars are always a good thing to wa watch any kind of insect with. A good field guide helps as well. A notebook to, to write down what you're observing and recording where you are and when you are. Remember that some wasps are nocturnal. So if any of you ever set out lights to attract moths, keep an eye out for, for other insects as well, especially wasps like, like bees. Some of the things that you'll observe when you're a wasp watcher are sleeping behavior. Believe it or not, wasps do sleep or spend inclement weather in kind of a, a, a state of, not diapause really, but just you know inactivity. And so they adopt various postures uh, in doing so. And, and mason wasps, for example, and cuckoo wasps tend to curl around a, a leaf or other piece of foliage and clamp on with their jaws or with their entire body. The same kind of thing happens with some of the other solitary wasps that adopt very interesting postures uh, that apparently are very comfortable for them to spend the night in. Looks kind of awkward to us, but it works for them. Some wasps gather in, in large numbers to spend the night or periods of inclemency, uh, like blue mud daubers and uh, some thinid wasps. And these are all males, by the way. And, and there are some other species where both sexes are included in, in these arrangements. But for the majority of the time, it seems to be male wasps that, that will do this. And of course, male wasps do not sting. Remember that. So while this looks intimidating, it really isn't. Grooming is another activity that is one of the, the few times you will get a wasp to sit still <laughs> and let you take pictures is when they're preening. And of course, they have to do that 
uh, to keep all their senses highly tuned to their environment. Wasps also enjoy the sun uh, as we do. And so they'll bask, they'll lean you know, or sprawl and uh, sit for long periods of time uh, absorbing the sun until they're warmed up to a point where they can resume their energetic activities. Wasps drink. Uh, this is especially true for wasps that, that make nests of, of mud or paper. They have to uh, you know, re-energize their supply of saliva to mix with their preferred uh, uh, manufacturing material. <laughs> And of course, feeding, uh, adult wasps uh, feed on high carbohydrate uh, resources and they're providing protein resources for their offspring. So again, a lot of, of, of flowers you will find wasps visiting. But many plants also produce extra floral nectaries and that is uh, sweet substances produced from other parts of the plant, maybe the leaf petiole or the bracts of the flower as in the case of sunflowers here in the United States. A lot of wasps take advantage of these extra floral nectaries. I found maybe more diversity on extra floral nectaries than I have on actual flowers. Wasps also like to eat oozing and fermenting sap from injured plants. And yes, they do get drunk on occasion. I don't know that that makes them any more aggressive, uh, just maybe a little sloppier and lazier in, in their behavior. And last but not least, uh, wasps get carbohydrates from the honeydew secreted from aphids and scale insects. And this is a really important thing to remember because in, in spring and fall, when aphids are very populous and very active, but there's few flowers blooming, this is where a lot of wasps and other insects get their energy. So a lot of beneficial insects are gonna come to your aphid colonies. So if you can tolerate them, at least in some measure, this is the kind of insect you're also supporting by having them around. And, and, and of course, some of the wasps are act, active parasitoids of aphids as well. Uh, wasps will also feed on the, the, the substances that exude from galls produced by other wasps mostly. <laughs> And watching wasps engage in nesting behavior is especially enjoyable. They're very, very efficient at this. And, and your sand wasps that tunnel into the soil are what we call kickers. They're using their front legs, which have a rake of spines on each foot, if you will. They're doing this, uh, to, they're kicking the sand out behind them. But not all wasps do this uh, when they're digging. Uh, other wasps are carriers like these thread-waisted wasps. They will dig into the soil, pick up a wad of it, fly off and disperse that, that accumulation of particles so that they're not building up some kind of pile of tumulus around the nest entrance. And that helps disguise the location of their nest to other parasitoids and predators. If you watch any kind of insect, you know that courtship and mating is, is the number, is, is if, Feeding and making more insects <laughs> are the two activities insects do best and wasps are no exception to this. And so sooner or later, you'll find wasps uh, engaged in courtship or mating or attempted mating. Uh, you know, sometimes the female is not real keen on this. And so she will uh, contort her abdomen to not present to the male much to his frustration in, in other wasp species, it's complicated. <clears throat> you have these particular wasps, the, the shield-handed wasps over on your side of the Atlantic as well. Uh, the males have these greatly inflated plates on their front legs that they use to cover the eyes of the female. It's unclear right now whether this just filters light in a way that makes him recognizable as a conspecific to the female, or if those plates exude pheromones that, that are, are kind of an aphrodisiac to her. There's still a lot to be learned about wasps and, and this is one good case in point. Males are territorial in many cases. Uh, here, they, here we have one applying a pheromone to a stem. Here on the right, we have one with a male with greatly 
uh, exaggerated eyes, uh, the better to see passing females or to intercept interloping males that he will chase off out of the, his territory. We have very large wasps here called cicada killers that specialize in, in, uh, in like their name implies, uh, killing cicadas. The females paralyze cicadas that they provide as food for their offspring in an underground burrow. The males are quite territorial and aggressive if you ask the average person. But again, the male is not a stinging insect, uh, but he is very defensive of his territory. You can also uh, help wasps by providing artificial housing like you do for bees. Bee blocks or bee condos uh, are, are going to be inhabited by wasps as well. Uh, here's one we had out when we lived in Colorado. We attracted a couple different species of mason wasps here, but it gets even more interesting than that. Um, here we have wasps called grass carriers that uh, they're solitary again. The female paralyzes small katydids or tree crickets as food. And then she uses cavities that she divides with uh, uh, bits of grass. And then she plugs the whole finished nest with a bundle of grass, as you see in the center photo there. They've also taken to using the uh, uh, sliding glass doors and windows frames as nesting sites. And so people will open their windows in the spring and wonder what, why they have a pile of grass and, and wasp larvae in there. With, with uh, wasps that use your, your nesting blocks, you're going to have other wasps that are parasitoids of them, like leucocospids and the uh, wild carrot wasps or gastroteids. They both uh, use the, the uh, nests of other wasps as hosts for their own offspring. And back to our bee block in, in Colorado, we did get some leafcutter bees to use it, but then they were followed by these sapigid wasps, which they hang out and watch the coming and going of the leafcutter bee intently to determine how long a period she is vacant from the nest. Then they go in and lay their egg in the, the nest. Kugel wasps are also parasitoids of many cavity nesting wasps and bees. And so you're sure to see these as well around your bee blocks. And while you're wasp watching, we hope that you'll post your observations to the platform of your choice. Uh, iNaturalist is very popular. Project NOAA is similar. Bug Guide is for, for North America. I don't know if you have a similar kind of platform there or not, but it, it's, it's worth, uh, worth looking into, certainly. And this is my Amazon moment. If you like the Wasps book and or me, uh, you might also like <laughs> uh, these two books that I have also co-authored. And with that, I'm going to, to conclude uh, what I have for you as far as uh, a presentation goes. Thank you. That was fantastic, Eric. Really, really interesting. And, and I didn't realize that you actually co-authored that Guide to Insects with the uh, venerable Ken Kaufman, who himself is a massive expert on birds. So there's nothing that man doesn't really uh, know about. Agreed. But, yeah, absolutely. But um, looking at your book, um, I suddenly realized that I have two favorite species of, or types of wasps. Uh, one of them is, I don't know if you can see, this guy here, mm -hmm. which it's a velvet ant, yeah? Yes. I love them. They look really lovely and cuddly. Um, I presume they're not that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they have, the, the females have very potent stings, very, very painful if you, if you attempt to handle them uh, roughly. But uh, uh, no, they're, they're parasitoids of other insects, especially ground nesting bees and wasps, but sometimes some of them will will get up into mud nests as well, or cavity nesting wasps. They're good climbers, many species are, uh, despite the fact that we usually see them running around on the ground. And the other species that I really love the sound of, at least, are the uh, emerald cockroach wasps, uh, purely because it does what it says in the tin. I'm not a fan of cockroaches. I can, can't stand them. 
So, um, and I'm sure there's plenty of good cockroaches out there. And I'm sure that one day we may have someone on In Conservation Move talking about how wonderful they are, but um, I like them. Anything to say about them? Oh, uh, how I worked for a, a couple of years at the Cincinnati Zoo Insectarium in Cincinnati, Ohio. And we had, we had one that we were hoping we could start a colony of them, you know, uh, the, the emerald Kuguwas. And, and watching their behavior was just fascinating uh, because they'll behave that way in captivity as well as in the wild. And, and so watching her stalk and, and uh, uh, paralyze this roach to the degree that it's under her control, by the way. The, the, the roach is still ambulatory, but it has no free will. And so she's able to lead it around by its antenna to a nest that she's already prepared, uh, stuff it in there, uh, sting it again into even deeper paralysis, uh, lay an egg on it, and then uh, seal up her nest and, and away uh, her offspring goes to feed on the, on the cockroach. So it's, yes, it's, it's very satisfying for, for sure. <laughs> I've done a first for in conservation with I've never done this before but I've actually changed my background midway through a conversation because I thought you know I better get appropriate here so these two um are a couple of hornets I saw fighting um once and I thought I'd take a picture of them so I I think I've now dragged myself up into credibility <laughs> now Eric, what drew you to wasps? I mean, I know you're an entomologist, and I know that the world of entomology is a vast one, and one that's still, there's a lot to learn from, but what, what, what interests you in particular about wasps? Uh, good question. Uh, I, I think if I'm being honest, uh, in my youth, uh, when I was collecting insects, I think I started collecting wasps because nobody could called me a sissy for catching something that could fight back. Uh, but you know, the, the more I learned about them though, in terms of their life cycles and, and behaviors, the more fascinating it became just for that alone. And, and certainly there's no end to the diversity and, and, and so little is known. I mean, if generally, unless a given insect is of economic benefit or cost, we don't know that much about it. And so it's really through people like, you know, Howard Evans and, and uh, Fabre and, and some of these, these people who, who said, you know, I'm going to study this anyway, even if no one else is interested, that we know what we do know. And, you know, this is becoming more relevant now that we have species we want to control in a natural fashion. And we're finding that that wasps are very good allies in that. Some are bred in, in big insectaries, in fact, to release onto crops to, to, uh, to battle pest insects. So th the more insects we know about in terms of their behavior and their place in the ecosystem, the better, but they're still, your, your chances of discovering something new to, to science or to your, your location with insects in general is very great and and with with wasps it goes up even another notch yeah because you talked about you know introducing alien species to to actually control the populations of other species and i remember when i was looking through your book uh, you mentioned a species that was introduced to control something um and I was about to think, oh, the next sentence will be, but it got out of control and now it's killing people. But in reality, according to what you said, it actually is doing a good job. In fact, it switched to another species of, of insect that was also um, a, a bit of a pest and is doing a job on that. Um, I don't remember what it's called. I don't either off the top of my head. Uh, most of the most of the wasps that are being used in, in agriculture are, are among those tiny ones. And the and, and that in, includes, by the way, not just the the crop itself in, you know, on a plot of land, but storage, you know, uh, grain storage and things of this nature. We have pests in there that can be controlled by wasps as well. So at, at several points in the agricultural process, we have wasps that are, are allies that way. But the, the problem is in finding 
wasps that are adaptable to more than one host because some host organisms are a lot easier to rear in captivity than they are out in the wild. And so you have to find a wasp that if, you're, if your target pest is one that you can't really raise very well in captivity, you have to find something similar that can be raised in captivity that the, the, the wasp will also accept as a host. So it, it's, not, it's not always really simple. <laughs> Okay, let's get back to the beginning, Ashley. Wasps, as you say in your book, your great book here, uh, wasps are related to bees and ants. And I guess they're more closely related to ants, but what is the relationship? That is a work in progress. Uh, it, you know, where things split and what is a wasp and what isn't a wasp varies with with who you ask. The generally ex, general consensus right now seems to be that ants are wingless social wasps and bees are hairy vegetarian wasps. It's, it's, it's pretty clear that wasps are at the base of, of those other two groups. And uh, now what precedes wasps is messier because there are, are, you know, the sawflies, are they wasps? Uh, we're not really, really sure about that. And then there's things like orucids that are, look like sawflies, but they're parasitoids. So they're not, not feeding like sawflies do on, on foliage in their youth, but they're, they're, they are feeding as parasitoids on other insects. And, and we're not sure where they fit. Uh, that's that's my understanding. Um, so it's yeah, it's still a work in progress, both from the fossil record and from analyzing you know the DNA of extant species as well. So it's it's a marriage of those two uh, two avenues of research. Going back to the very beginning when we sort of well, when I was trying to segue whilst you're putting on your your um, presentation and. I guess I spoke from billions of people out there thinking that wasps are purely the yellow and black ones and that's it. Why are they so annoying um, in the autumn when you're trying to have a jam sandwich outside or drink a can of Coke? Uh, okay. Um, this is where I like to turn the, the interpretation on its head. Um, I mean, you, we talked about cockroaches as well. I think the thing that infuriates us about insects that we call pests are their ability to very efficiently exploit every weakness we have. And so when you're having a picnic or a barbecue uh, and you've got wasps coming to it, it's, it's, you know, the wasp doesn't recognize the difference between your brisket and your, you know, a roadkill or the leftovers from a, a coyote kill it's all the same to them. It's protein and I'm going to get it from whatever's handy. And so, you know, you know, if you set out a, a, a plate of eclairs for your bridge club and I get there first, Hey, you know, um, <laughs> that's kind of what's happening. So, you know, and you know, the wasps that build their nests on our, our houses and our buildings. Well, our architecture is a great imitation of cliff faces and overhangs where they would nest naturally. So we're inadvertently inviting other species to, to our, our uh, culture, our lifestyle. And so uh, they're annoying because, oh, we failed to take that into consideration. Um, and by the way, for safety's sake, please do not serve beverages outdoors in cans or opaque bottles. Uh, if a wasp crawls into either one of those vessels and you don't see it and you take a sip, that's really bad news. And even if you're not, you know, allergic to, to uh, bee or wasp venom, uh, that could be a life-threatening experience. Uh, so yeah, yeah, we have to, we have to uh, think this through <laughs> and, uh, and plan accordingly. But yeah, wasps are, the adult wasps are after sweet things like soda pop and, and your jam. And they're also looking for protein in, in you know, meats to take back to the nest to feed to their growing larvae. Yeah, I've heard about people swallowing wasps and being stung inside their mouths. But what is the 
evasive. What's the what's the best way of getting wasps not to bother you? I mean, I've seen I've been at barbecues where they put out water with honey and something else and left it in a little tray, and all the wasps make a beeline for that. But they still come and annoy you when you're eating your your, your sandwich. But is there a, a fail safe way of ditch of having these guys at your party, but they can have their own table? Um, yeah, setting out uh, you know uh, meat scraps for them. Uh, maybe after you've cut up your your brisket or whatever or your chicken or or something, putting the scraps out for them. Uh, they would much rather not. Uh, you know, they would much rather forage in, in a place where they're not having people wave their hands at them all the time. So, um, I mean, seriously, there's there's something to be said for for setting them their own little little table. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you know, just, you know, warn people ahead of time. OK, we might have some wasp visitors. Just don't panic. You know, wait for them to do their thing and then resume eating. Uh, I mean, you know, I've had them take pieces out of my sandwich while I was eating it. Uh, I, I didn't react violently to that, and we were all good. Now, let's talk about violence, actually, because that's what you think about when you look at the creature on my shoulder. Um, firstly, I wasn't really, I didn't really appreciate that the males are not the stingers, it's the females. Is that is that the golden rule across all wasps? Yes, but uh, actually, again, there's, you know, not all wasps sting at all, uh, and the the, the social ones are more prone to because they're they're defending an entire nest with great many vulnerable defenseless larvae pupae and eggs and so they're they're going to be you know if you the, the worst thing to do is disturb a nest of those uh, everything else you know if you're paying attention you know you shouldn't have an issue with them uh, I know that's that's easier said than done especially with people that work outdoors and our landscaping and things, and they're not going to notice a nest, maybe even. Um, but uh, anyway, the vast majority of solitary wasps either don't sting or they're so busy hunting uh, and making their nests that they they rarely at all interact with people. Yeah, I mean, I've had, um, I'm, I'm in Southwest Spain, and uh, especially during lockdown, I've, I used to spend time on the sun terrace and I've watched a couple of wasps make their paper nest under my fencing. And, you know, I thought, you stay there, I stay here, we're great friends. And that's how it worked out. It was fine until one day when I was hanging my clothes out, my washing horse, clothes horse, and it fell over near the nest and they were got, they got a bit aggravated. But this year, someone came to fix my blinds on my front window, my French windows in the front, or Spanish windows. And uh, there was a paper wasp nest um, above the window, which I've been observing over the summer. And, you know, they stay outside, I stay inside, it's all fine. But the guy that came, the first thing he'd done, without me actually asking me, just whacked the nest away into the street. And I was hoping, I hope those wasps wait for you downstairs and you get out because they weren't doing anything to you. Now, in your book, you talk about the Schmidt Sting Pain Index and you listed the top 10 stingers. Now, I'm really fascinated by this because I've only ever been stung by a wasp once. I was in Italy and a wasp stung me in my hand. And I was more shocked by the fact that I got stung than the fact that, you know, than the fact that I was actually supposed to be in pain. And uh, the, the house owner ran over with sugar and rubbed sugar onto my finger and I felt nothing, it was, it was done. But anyway, going back to the question, top 10 stingers, what kind of pain are we talking about? Uh, uh, well, the, the person that created that, uh, Justin Schmidt, uh, one, of, one of the most interesting researchers I've, I've ever met, by the way, uh, and he has his own book out, uh, The Sting of the Wild, which I highly recommend because it's, it's a, it's a, he, he's, he tells great stories. Um, but for each of those stings, he has a description attached to it. And I don't, I don't have that handy at the moment, um, but <laughs> it's very evocative. Like uh, 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 a sweat bee, for example, would be a low end of the scale. And it's like, you know, a, a fruit, you know, slightly fruity scent. And, and you know, I mean, it's, it's very, you know, very uh, 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 
eclectic in, in how he describes these stings. But like for a tarantula hawk, I think it was something like uh, someone dropped a hair dryer in your bath uh, kind of scenario. So, um, you know, he's using the honeybee sting as his baseline at a number two on his scale of one to, to five or one to four. And uh, so figuring that most people could relate to that in one way or another, but mostly it's your, it's your immune system's reaction to a sting rather than the, the power of the venom there. I mean, you know, that has a lot more to do with it. Uh, and I mean, I can speak to that from my own experience, I think, but, um, but the, the other interesting thing was that in the case of some of these really wickedly stinging things, it's all pain. There's no damage. And, and that's the interesting thing. There's no, you know, pain is usually an indication of, of damage. And the, the worse it is, the worse the damage you would think. But in the case of like tarantula hawks, it's about three minutes of agonizing pain and then you're, it's done. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's, again, we haven't done that much research into insect venoms. Uh, and what we're learning is, you know, there, there's some in, in applications to medicine that are very good. So, um, you know, that's about all I can say, probably. I'd recommend his, his book, and, and, uh, which includes the, the pain index. Yeah, because I read about the tarantula hawk whilst you talked about, and yes, three minutes of sheer hell, and then it's all over. So they must be used in initiation ceremonies, <laughs> ceremonies surely. Um, well, like I said, I've only been stung once, but do you think a lot of it's hype as well? I mean, you look at things like the hornet um, behind me, they, you know, we know as, as naturalists and people that appreciate nature, but they are gentle giants, but you read the media and it's all about killer hornets. But that said, I mean, you've got the Asian hornet, is that given a, a, the, the, the right kind of credential as being a killer? It, it is in, in as, at least in terms of an economic sense. Uh, we're, you know, here in North America, we're now worried about the Asian giant hornet that has come across and is now present in British Columbia, Canada and adjacent Washington state. And the, the fear there is not so much, you know, human casualties as it is apiculture because the, the, those hornets are well known for raiding beehives and dispatching, you know, almost in the entirety of a beehive to get to the larvae that they will then take back to feed to their larval wasps and the honey stores that they'll raid uh, to feed themselves. And so they, they could potentially be pretty devastating to apiculture. How that, uh, you know, whether or not they're gonna be impactful to the ecosystem is, is such a new a situation that the jury is still out on that one. Uh, but certainly any organism that is suddenly in a place it didn't originate in is, is generally not a good sign and should be looked at with a great degree of, of, of uh, intensiveness <laughs> uh, to make sure it's not going to become something threatening. But this is, you know, this is again, a problem of commerce. You know, this is the this is the unintended consequence of international trade, and it's not being reflected at all in the marketplace, in legislation at an international level. Uh, you know, and and yet, and we're so we're having these you know e ecological catastrophes from oil spills to uh, to invasive species as a result of deregulated commerce, and uh, I I don't have any ready answers to that. But I think it is going to have to start with consumers and, you know, what are we willing to sacrifice uh, in, in uh, order to maintain ecological integrity and economic integrity, too, for that matter. Okay, that leads me nicely on to uh, my final, well, actually penultimate question. What is your favorite not necessarily species, but what is your favorite group of wasps, or if you can name a particular species, what is it? Um, I kind of have to side with you, actually. I really like the velvet ants. 
uh, probably the, the velvet ants and and the uh, the the spider wasps, I think, because the spider wasps are really challenging to to find and photograph uh, out in the wild because they're so high energy. They they you know barely sit still, sit still even to groom themselves, and they often do that in places where I can't get a photo. Uh, so I, I like the challenge of of wasps like that. Uh, I, I like watching the the uh, thread wasted wasps and sand wasps do their excavation and the other collections of insects that, that follow them in, in that regard. So uh, it, yeah, it is hard to pinpoint, but from, from a perspective of beauty and, and aesthetics, yeah, I, I, I like the velvet ants also. Yeah, it's amazing how, the, how slim the waste of a thread, um, what's it called again, thread wasted wasp. Yeah. Good name. Um, it's amazing how, there must be the envy of a lot of models out there. Um, <laughs> If you could be anywhere on this planet right this very moment, where would you be? Oh, understanding um, any any current uh, ban, travel bans, or COVID tests you may need to take. Right. Oh, uh, gee. Um, well, it's such a it's a beautiful day right here right now. Which which uh, you know, in terms of climate, because of global warming, it's it's. You know, it's not what we used to say. You know, right? I'd, oh, I'd like to be in California right now on a beach, or or Florida, or somewhere. It's it's like, well, I'm I'm not too bad right here, <laughs> but uh, I would like to be in a place with with more uh, slightly more biodiversity. Uh, so probably somewhere closer to the equator. Uh, but I only speak English, darn it. Uh, so, then <laughs> uh, <laughs> you got to be in Belize, yeah. No, I have not yet. Um, Belize, I speak yeah. English there. I, I, I am aware of that. Yeah. yeah. So, so maybe there. Cool. Okay. All right, Zoomers, thank you very much for, for attending tonight, um, this afternoon. Um, we are going to have a little break from In Conservation. I think we've given you a lot of information to mull over over the last couple of months. We're going to be back in January give you a bit of a break but if, if anything does break in terms of news between now and Christmas of course we'll, we'll, we'll rush out an episode but I'd like to thank Eric for sparing this afternoon and really uh, enlightening enlightening us when it comes to the world of the wasp so thank you very much sir oh thank you it's been an honor well thank you and everyone out there um I know that you may be watching this in the future, so ignore what I'm about to say. Have a great Christmas, and I'll see you in the new year. And don't forget to keep looking up. <laughs>